computer viruses are unfortunately still common nowadays. Hopefully your security measures are keeping you well clear of them. But there are some new varieties and types making an appearance. We felt that it was time that we spoke with an expert, and there's no better known name than that of Dr. Alan Solomon. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Solomon. Let's talk, if we may, first of all, about how common viruses are. I said they are common, but uh, what's the average incidence? Well, IBM have done some figures which uh, indicate that if you've got, uh, say, a thousand computers, then you'll see uh, four incidents per year. Now, an incident can be anything from a single floppy disk with a virus on, which is dealt with just like that, up to several computers infected with you're not sure how many, you're not sure what the virus has done, you're not sure how long it's been there, and it can be quite a, a big hassle to get rid of it. Right, okay. There are some new terms that I'm hearing that I genuinely don't understand, like stealth viruses, polymorphic viruses. Could you explain what these are and what they are doing? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, stealth viruses. With a stealth virus, if the virus is memory resident, then it aims to conceal it, its presence on the disk from you. So any attempt to look at the virus gets diverted around the virus, as it were. So you, you can look straight at it and not see it. Um, that goes back a long time. The first stealth virus that uh, I ever saw was nine years old. Uh, polymorphic viruses is a little more uh, recent. The first polymorphic virus I saw was five years ago, but that's getting increasingly important. A polymorphic virus is one where the virus body is encrypted and the decryptor is variable. So if you put two instances of the virus side by side, there are no bytes in common between them, which means you can't just search for a string of bytes because there is no constant string of bytes and each instance of the virus looks differently. Right. It's actually the same virus, it's not mutating or changing, yes. it just presents a different appearance to you in each instance. So you can't search for it with a pattern then? Not a simple sequence of bytes, mm. it's got to be a lot more complicated than that. Mm. Um, you might have to go as far as writing uh, a, a dedicated algorithm for, for, for finding that virus, although um, that's, not the, that's not the way that I would go about it. Right. So how does SNS International go about writing code to find stealth viruses, for example? Well, the weakness of a stealth virus is that although the virus in memory is concealing the virus on the disk, the virus can't conceal itself in memory. So if you find the virus in memory, you now know that the virus is there. You then uh, have to, one way or another, clear the virus out of memory, and then you can see it on the disk. So it's actually fairly straightforward. But you do have to do that memory check. Right. OK. And polymorphic viruses, if you can't look at them and, and see mm. them? Well, you can look at polymorphic viruses and see them, but what are you looking for? Yes, there is no exactly. fixed pattern to look yes. for. You can either write a complex algorithm for each virus, but that can be very time-consuming in terms of programming development. Well, the approach we've taken is we decrypt the virus uh, we've written a thing we call the generic decryption engine. Each, each polymorphic virus is decrypted. Once you've got it decrypted, what's inside the encryption is constant. And right. now you can just search for a fixed sequence of bytes. Right. There's uh, another term that, uh, that's popped up recently, and that's macroviruses. Hmm. Um, I haven't heard of that, I think. You'd no, it, it, that. it is very new. Um, it's only in the last uh, several weeks that we've actually seen macroviruses existing. We always knew of the theoretical possibility of macroviruses, but you know, one kind of hopes that it isn't going to happen, at least not but this no year. But twigs like you have, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a macrovirus, well, the, the, the macrovirus that's gotten really common is called concept, and it's a, a word macrovirus. It's, it works under Word 6, and Word 6, whether it's Word 6 for Windows, for Windows 95, for Windows NT, or even for Macintosh, right. the macro still works. Right. It's a common macro language. So it really is gen genuinely a macro? Yes. Yeah, well, right. actually, it's a set of five. The concept virus is actually a set of five macros. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's genuinely a, a, a macro virus. And when you actually look at the, uh, the code for the, the word macro virus, you see it. It's just sort of listed out there in mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple thing to write. Mm -hmm. So it, it moves around attached to a document or something then, presumably? Mm. Um, it turns out that well, we've always told people that data cannot get infected by a virus, and that's mm. still true. 
Uh, but what you might not have realized is that a document isn't just data. It's data plus potentially executable code, and that's yes. what these macros are. Right. And the way that the concept virus works is as soon as you click on a document, it infects your template. And thereafter, because you use that template for every document, every document that you load gets infected. And it right. spreads really fast within a company right. because people are sharing documents all the time. Right. What does this virus actually do? Well, the, uh, the payload uh, is nothing at all. There is a macro called payload. Mm -hmm. contains nothing more than a comment that says, that's enough to prove my point. It looks like <laughs> the concept virus was written by a professional programmer looking at the, uh, the code. It looks like it was done by not just some kid. And it looks like it was written mostly to prove that it's possible to write macro viruses, which is mm. a bit like me punching you on the nose just to prove that it's going to hurt. Yes. Well, you already knew that. Mm. Yes, quite so. <laughs> let, let me ask you a question that I, I don't know if, if you'll be able to answer, but who writes these viruses? Have you ever met anybody, for example, that's written a virus? Yeah, I've, uh, I've met several, several virus authors. You ha first of all, you have to understand it's not actually illegal to write a virus. If you own a computer, you can do anything you like to it. You can smash it up with a sledgehammer if it's your computer. So, yeah. Yeah. It's not illegal to write a virus. It is illegal to uh, deliberately spread a virus onto somebody else's computer without their permission. That's right. the criminal offence. That's the right. Computer Misuse Act uh, 1990 offence. Mm -hmm. um, I've met several virus authors, and just about every virus author I've met is what I would call a kid meaning mm. aged 15 to 22, mm. um, interested in computers. Um, and what he's doing is he's just playing with his computer and he's having fun. <laughs> and he's written a virus and he hasn't realized, perhaps, that it's uh, irresponsible and wrong to, to pass it on to other people. Mm. Because when, when, when you're 15, you don't think about mm. such things. But some of these are wholly destructive, aren't yeah. they? They're designed. Yeah. No, yeah, away from the answer. yeah. Uh, but that's actually a minority of viruses. Most viruses, the payload is either nothing at all, like in the case of the, mm. the concept virus, or one of the commonest viruses around is the form virus, mm. which on the 18th of the month, each key that you use on the keyboard goes beep, and that's the payload. Mm. That's no great comfort, though, to an organization that's got the form or, or the concept virus, because mm. As far as they're concerned, they're going to get rid of it, and that is going to take time and, right. and time's money. And so even a virus which is aimed at doing no damage still does damage. Right. How many viruses is Dr. Solomon's antivirus toolkit now covering? We're currently counting about 7,000. 7,000? It's, uh, it's, it, it's one or 200 more each month. Yes. And you started off, on, you were telling me six. just before, we, with, with six. Six, yes, yes, yes. The first version of the toolkit detected all of six viruses. And I remember writing in the manual, if there are any more viruses, then we'll bring out an upgrade. <laughs> so you brought out <laughs> 6,900. <laughs> yes, OK, I think we can all do the, uh, do the mental arithmetic. Um, is this ever going to end? Or is this mm. going to be a never-ending story all the time we have computers? I think it's never going to end. It's a bit like expecting to grow roses without getting green fly. Mm. Um, the green fly issue is not a big deal. You keep it under control, you spray, spray you still get mm. nice, nice flowers, but you, you, you know for sure that you're always going to have to deal with the green fly issue, and it's the same with viruses. There's mm. always, always going to be viruses as long as it's possible to write viruses, there will be kids who do it. And I believe it's always going to be possible to write viruses because you could design a computer and operating system under which viruses are not possible. But to do that, you'd have to take so much functionality out of the system mm. that nobody would want to buy it. Mm. Yes, that's a good point. Mm. Dr. Solomon, thank you very much for joining us here today. Welcome. And if you'd like information on SNS International's antivirus products, uh, of course, just fill in the appropriate section of the reply pay card. Now, here's Alison with Multimedia Futures. The HD CD battle is over. You will no doubt remember us saying in the last edition that Sega Enterprises were backing the double-sided Toshiba Time Warner Matsushita-sponsored high-density CD format. Bad move. As the Toshiba-led group have just announced that the sixth company in its camp 
have accepted the Sony Philips proposal to unify the standard. The new digital video disc standard will use Sony's signal modulation protocols and Toshiba's error correction. The standard is backwardly compatible with today's CD-ROMs and will have a capacity of 4.7 gigabytes per side. That's enough for 133 minutes of high quality film replay. The new video CD standard will be known as DVD. If you're a CompuServe fan, you'll be familiar with the GIF graphics standard. GIF stands for Graphics Interchange Format. At the end of last year, Unisys, who owned the underlying compression technology, revived an elderly patent and said it would require royalties for any new software supporting the GIF format. In January, a group of internet graphics developers got together to draft what has now made its appearance as the Portable Graphics Network specification. The file extension is PNG, but it's pronounced PING. The new format is available free to anyone who wishes to incorporate it into their software and is fully supported by CompuServe Inc. The whole thing illustrates how quickly new open system standards can be established when there's a need. Some of you may remember that British Telecom set up a games publishing division in the early 80s, only to sell it off in April 1989 with huge losses. 1996, however, will see the launch of BT's Wireplay National Network. It will enable PC users to play multi-user games across the UK. BT expects the system to become popular based on a low pricing policy. A BT spokesman said, we expect this to stimulate a latent market because it will be very easy to use and very easily priced. As the battle for the online services market hots up, CompuServe announced plans to give each of its 3.4 million customers up to one megabyte of storage to create their own World Wide Web home page. At the same time, the company announced a couple of tools, including one called Homepage Wizard, to ease the web page construction process. The service centres beta testing about now, with a general rollout to CompuServe members planned for November. Finished pages will be placed onto the web automatically using Publishing Wizard. CompuServe are even intending to supply an image scanning service to help homepage builders to get original photographs and slides into their pages. And finally, video camcorders are becoming so clever now that Canon has developed one that it claims can be controlled by eye movements alone. Called the Movie Boy E2, the camcorder has just become available in Japan at $2,000. Focusing, switching on the record function and other operations can all be controlled through eye movements. Canon says that it will start by producing $10,000 a month. And that's APT's Multimedia Futures for October 1995. Multimedia Futures is available via the internet. Email info at apt.globalnews.com. Please mention video interface in your inquiry.